Thank you, Christelle. You're hearing me well, I hope. Let me come down here and just be with you for a second and say there's a lot of space up front. So if you're coming in, I see people are still filtering. Don't hesitate to, to come closer. If you thought this was a session you could come to and just relax, maybe shut your eyes for a few minutes, you're in the wrong room. We are going to try to engage you in the discussion today because this is really a conversation that requires all of you. And this is the kind of conference that is really unique. I was telling Gitinji this last evening uh, and Desta this last evening. There are very few conferences, and I'm on the conference circuit. There are very few that really bring together people doing the actual work on the front lines with those designing the policies and funding these programs. So it's really unique, and it's a great opportunity, and I'm honored to be a part of it today. Uh, I want to introduce one more acronym to a field that has way too many acronyms. And apologies for the French translation, because this will be hard. Anyone know what a BHAG is? BHAG. B-H-A-G. We got one, two, a couple, three. A big, hairy, audacious goal. A big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, that's what the Sustainable Development Goals are. That's what UHC is. That is what the idea of the last mile first is. It sounds almost ridiculous when you think about the massive challenges in the world today. A billion people don't have access to primary care. Half the world does not have access to basic essential medicine according to the WHO guidelines. So here we are talking about the last mile first. Are we crazy? Is this possible? Well, this is a BHAG. This is a goal that is so tough, so audacious, but possible if we change the way we think. And that's really what today's session is about. Um, so I want to ask us to begin with something a little unusual. You don't see this at every conference. We're going to start with an accountability session, a fireside chat. And we have two people to come up. We have the Honorable Minister, the Minister of Health, Diane Gashumba, who is here, and uh, Senet Fischesa, who's here as well. Can you please join us on stage? Uh, wh while they're making their way, I will just say a word or two um, about them. You know that we're here in Rwanda. Rwanda is a real leader on global health systems. Please, come forward. And I'll ask you to just take these two seats here, and that would be perfect, yes. And Honorable Minister here would be perfect as well. Thank you. And I'll just say that uh, we're, we're looking at really two sides of the coin. We have here the perspective from a Minister of Health who has to think about the overall health system, and the perspective of someone who is at the community level. Uh, some of you may have heard Sinead Fisesa speak earlier. Uh, she is a health extension worker in Ethiopia. And so she's joined by her translator on stage uh, who, because she speaks Amharic. She'll be speaking Amharic for those of you who understand in the audience. Uh, and I just want to start by asking you, Sinead, to tell us a little bit about yourself. We're talking about last mile first, so let's start with the last mile. What is it like in the community where you work? What are the challenges you face? I'm not a federal. 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 እኛ ያሉብን ችግሮች አሉ ያሉብን ችግሮች በመብራት በውሃ እንደገና እንደሞ በመንገድ ትራንስፖርት እነዚህ ችግሮች አሉ ምን ሰራው ስራ ግን በጠቃላይ ያው አሁን በጤና ኤክስቴንሽን ህብረተሰቡ ለኛ ተጠያቂ የሚያደርግብን ነገሮች አሉ ለአብነት ያው በ በኮሚኒቲ ላይ ማለት ነው የሚሰሩ ስራዎች እንትንም እናደርግበት የሚሞላ ካርድ አለ በዛ ካርድ መሰረት እነሱኛን ተጠያቂ ያደርጉናል እኛም ደግሞ የጤና የጤና ባለሙያዎች በጤና ጣቢያ ደረጃ ማለት ነው እነሱ ለኛ ደግሞ እቅድ አለ በዛ እቅድ መሰረት እኛ እንዴት ነው የሰራ ነው ምን አለ ችግር በሚለው ላይ እንጠየቃለን ማለት ነው ስለዚህ ተጠያቂነት ህብረተሰቡ ምኛን ይጠይቀናል እኛ ደግሞ የሚጠይቁን ያው የጤና ጣቢያ አካላት ለነሱም ያው በየደረጃው ይያለ እዚያ ኡድ አፍተርኑን 
Uh, my name is Sanait Fisaha and I'm a health extension worker and uh, we're kept accountable by both the community and by the health center as well. How the community keeps us accountable is because, of we, because we have uh, cards that the community is going to fill and accord, accordingly will be accountable to the community. So we do lots of works but we also have some challenges and the challenges can be like transportation challenges, electricity and water. These are some of the challenges we have. And my understanding is you serve 9,000 families in the community where you work, and that's you and one other health extension worker. And how do you get around? You said transportation is a challenge, but make it clear to us. How do you get around to see these 9,000 families? ወደኛን ያው <laughs> Uh, we walk on foot and we can walk from one and a half hours to two hours. Uh, also, our patients come to us by foot, but if they are pregnant mothers, ambulance is going to be provided. Uh, and accordingly, we're going to do our work. And we also have uh, health army workers, so they, tr they can transfer them to us and uh, they will tell them when they need to come and see us. So accordingly, they will come to the health center. My understanding is you have been a health extension worker for about six years now. You started as a volunteer and you've gone through uh, several trainings now. One major training that has now made you a level four health extension worker. What can you do now as a level four health extension worker that you couldn't do before? <laughs> ከዚያ <laughs> እየተለያዩ <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear the translation so we can all clap. Well, t tell us what she said. <laughs> uh, initially, I was just involved in mobilization, but I've went through different kinds of education. So I was on level three, but after level three, I also learned for a year, and now I'm level four. So I even give different kinds of contracep contraceptives, and we have even been able to provide long-acting long contraceptives. Yeah, even IUCD, I can provide. You can clap now. You can clap for that. So I want to turn to the Honorable Minister uh, and ask you, as you think about an entire country's health system, and you hear this phrase, last mile first, which can become like a buzzword, something we just repeat without thinking about it. But when you think about it, what does it mean for your health system? What does it mean for your plans as Rwanda's health minister? Yeah, the, uh, I'm happy to be on this panel with uh, my colleagues here sharing the same story about uh, the importance of uh, community health based 
system because uh, this is a shared story between Ethiopia and Rwanda. And to me, there is nothing stronger than having a solid system based on community health workers operating at the household level. So we consider this uh, platform or this model as uh, w something we cherish a lot in Rwanda. And um, fact are there, we, if we always say that if we manage to reach the Millennium Development Goals, this is because of this community of workers. So we really value this and uh, we are always happy to have Ethiopia with us because we learn a lot from this uh, uh, community of workers model from Ethiopia. I know one of the key questions that our community health extension worker here wants to ask and many others here are concerned about is the status of community health workers. Are they paid? Are they paid sufficiently? What is their role in the health system? Um, I, I could turn to Sinead herself to ask you her, this question because I know she wants to ask you and we'd love to hear your response uh, to, to this issue. Please. Yeah, because I'm a Catalan, but I go. Yeah, the Lalu Talafio Chimion, the Lalechu Minister Lesuanumet Ayiko, and ya, Aun, Leluch Africa Gara, and then, and then ya, who note any extension Balamoch, Minimica Felacho Bermilem, Betmertum, Aunia, Calabel Seri, what a level four, Calabel four, level five, him, Jamerwal Malet. In the Sugagan, Minimum Mika Felacho Nagari Elem, Anthony in the Tatayak and Net Miader Gacho Nagar, Matka Floko Haneber, Tatayak and Net Litader Goat Chilimena, and Dayton Obezi, Mini Yeta Saradler, Kalka Felkoso, Meninet Tatayak in Litader Gomet Chilonagar, Minim Nagar Salella, Bazila, Mini Yeta Serrano. Minaynetus yau yete jamara nager nendala yen mat ayek fadlgallo. I want to ask the honourable minister and all policymakers. For instance, in Ethiopia, we are well paid. We're, we're paid for the work that we do, but in most other African countries, community health workers are not paid. So when you're not paying them, how can you ask them? How can you uh, really make them accountable? And what? What are you doing for them? For instance, in Ethiopia, they have opportunities to, for education and to advance their career, but I don't hear that the same in the other countries. So how do you hold them accountable? Honorable Minister, please let, let us know your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would say that uh, it depends on the, on the definition you are giving to the word paying. Paying, yeah. You can pay through a regular salary, uh, now I will speak for Rwanda, for example, and uh, we need to look at the background of uh, our country and see how this, uh, this uh, program was uh, initiated and when it was initiated. From the background, our community focus program is based on voluntarism. But I fully agree with you that you cannot ask someone to work from morning to evening without paying. Their families need to leave, they need to, they need to take care of their families, and they spend a lot of hours uh, dedicating their lives to people, to neighbors, and to the communities they're serving. But we have our own way to pay these people. And when you look at the survey that was conducted two years ago uh, about the satisfaction of community health workers in Rwanda, 93% of those community health workers to the question that was asked to them, what will happen if you don't get the performance-based incentive you are getting? They all said, we will remain working for this platform, for this community. And they said, there's nothing more rewarding than the trust they can see among the community they are serving. That is something very meaningful here in Rwanda. But we have, we are paying them through performance-based financing. What does it mean? It's an accountability system the government of Rwanda has put in place. So we have key indicators that are related to the work they are doing. For example, let me give an example. The number of women with uh, postpartum hemorrhage that were consulted by community health workers and referred to the hospital. 
and how many visits a community health worker has, has performed within uh, a quota. So we buy these indicators and we pay fees to the community workers based on performance. And I think, I think that is something we should even explore for public servants, even ministers in some countries, <laughs> because it has shown positive results. When we work toward target and uh, positive result, you always push to have uh, good result and to be well paid. And I was talking to some of our community workers, actually the money they get. There are many people uh, with the same level of education here in Rwanda and many surrounding countries who don't even get half of this amount. So second thing, another strategy the government has put in place, we have uh, sensitized our community focus to be in cooperatives. And those cooperatives are elaborating uh, income generating projects. Some have uh, commercial buildings, some are involved in agriculture, others are having a livestock pro pro project, and they gain money. They gain money, and some of them are even capable to hire accountant to look after the project, because otherwise they will be spending hours and hours looking after the financial uh, project. So I think our community workers are doing very great and another facilitation we are giving them, we make sure that they get the tools they need. The kit, meaning phones to be able to communicate with the health centers, solar panel energy, our president has recently offered solar panels to all community health workers to make sure that if they want to treat people during night, they don't struggle with electricity and we offer all the kits they need to treat, uh, to treat kids. So this is our way to pay our community workers, health workers, but the most important thing is this recognition we have for them. And they speak, they, they say it, it's not me saying it, it's from a survey we conducted. And you've seen that uh, uh, wonderful lady who was on the panel yesterday, she's called Beatrice. She didn't mention salary because she knows she has a different type of salary that is uh, satisfying her and her peers. So I think we have heard, you're welcome to applaud for that. I think there were some people ready to applaud. And that, I, I think we, as we move to our panel, we've taken two uh, important points out of these, these interventions. One is the idea that if you have a community health worker, you need to empower them with the right tools, as you just described. We heard about the importance of having the right ability to travel and through the transportation to get around to the many, many families that community health workers have to serve, having electricity, having basic infrastructure, having access to a, to a mobile phone and to a data plan. So the tools are really important. And then I think the other big idea is the focus on results, on metrics, including for health ministers, which is a, big, a radical <laughs> idea, a KPI for health ministers. So thank you both for raising those points as we begin a, a larger discussion with our panel. And I want to uh, ask all of you to not only uh, join me in, in thanking our fireside participants, but if you were waiting to take a picture, this is a pretty good picture to take today, a, a health minister sitting next to a community health worker. So I'll ask you both to stand up for a moment before you leave the stage and give everyone a chance to applaud you and take a picture. Senit, come to the middle for one second. <laughs> Let's get this recorded. Thank you both very much. And, and I'll ask our panelists to please join me on stage um, and take any seat you can. It's first come, first serve. I see some of our panelists here. Please, please uh, make your way to the stage. As you're doing that, I will, I will just mention that we are at an important moment in, in the history of human health, in the history of global health. We are close to, please join us on stage. We are close to uh, eradicating several diseases uh, we're at a point where w one statistic I saw recently says by next year we may have 20 billion, it's hard to believe that number, but something like 20 billion inter internet connected health devices. Um, we are at a moment when there is new sources of funding, including half a trillion dollars in billionaire philanthropy that's been pledged to many health issues in particular. Uh, so there's seemingly lots and lots of opportunity. Uh, and yet, we all know the realities in places like where Sinait works at the last mile, how challenging it is. So what we want to talk about today in this discussion is how do we get past some of those challenges? How do we move to a point 
we're talking about the last mile first is not just a slogan, but it's actually a way of working. And uh, so I want to ask someone who works on this every day, where's Magnus? There you are in the, in the, in the middle. Magnus, the executive director, Magnus Conte is the executive director of the, uh, of the African Center for Global Health and Social, I'm sorry, executive director of the Community Health Academy at Last Mile Health, of course. Um, and of course, Last Mile Health, it's in your name. So that's why I want to start with you. You've been working on, on this concept for many, many years. Now it suddenly seems like we're in a moment when there's global, and especially in Africa, there's widespread understanding that this is important. But is it just still a slogan, or do you see it actually turning into a real change in the way we all work? Thank you. Um, as already mentioned, my name is Magnus Conte. I am the executive director for the Community Health Academy at Last My Health. Um, Last My Health was founded um, on the belief that no one should die because they live too far from a doctor. For 12 years, uh, the organization has partnered with uh, governments um, to develop community-based programs uh, and advocate for the professionalization of community health workers who strengthen health systems and transform health outcomes within the hardest to reach parts of um, the globe. And we started in Liberia and we are now taking a global approach to supporting other governments through advocacy and through other direct engagements uh, in some of those countries. And Liberia, where we've been embedded for these past 12 years, has demonstrated that this is possible. You can actually build very strong community health work programs uh, with uh, support to the national government and making sure that this is um, uh, achievable. In 2006, the government of Liberia uh, launched the National Community Health Assistance Program uh, with support from other partner organizations, including Last Mile Health, um, to reach this on, on uh, difficult and challenging um, areas of the country and provide health services for, for these communities. The program aimed to deliver or develop uh, 4,000 community health assistants to deliver health care in these remote communities. And to date, over 1.2 million uh, people uh, that live in the hardest to reach parts of the country are being served by these community health workers. Um, what do you 70 think, what, what, sorry to interrupt you, Magnus, but what do you think is the key to that success? Because that's a pretty remarkable statistic that you've gone to 1.2 million people at the last mile. And many, I don't know how many people here know Liberia, but there are places where you have to walk, take a boat, take a bus. I mean, not, not easy to get when you say last mile, really yes. last mile that you're serving. What was the secret to that success? The secret to that really is um, partnering with governments and supporting local communities to develop their own services and provide health care for their own communities. The, the fact that we were able to reach those communities also takes dedication, determination, and perseverance. We should never give up. If we say um, universal health coverage for all, it means all. It means even those um, um, citizens who are in far and last mile health communities, we have a responsibility, uh, either as government or as NGOs who work within this space, to ensure that they, we take our services to them. So it's that kind of dedication and determination and collaboration with uh, governments and other partners. Is it just a moral obligation to go to people who are at the last mile, who don't have access to the health system? Or is there another reason to do this? Is there another reason why this would make sense as, a, as our first objective? Sure. Firstly, um, governments have responsibility for delivering health services to the population in terms of the health and well-being of, of, of society, it's government responsibility. But beyond that, it is also health is a human right. And if we say health is a human right, we should not just say it. We should actually make sure that we actualize it. I mean, yesterday during the course of the, uh, the panel discussion, somebody mentioned the fact that uh, it is not government will that's the issue, it's government action. But I, I would push that beyond that point to say that uh, it's our action, all of us, working together to make sure that we deliver services at the last mile, where it matters most. Can I bring you into the discussion? Ronald De Young is the Executive Vice President of Philips. And I wonder, Philips is, is a major corporation working in global health, and you're working all across Africa. You know, 
the last mile, I still wonder why do people focus there? You know, there's so many opportunities in, in urban centers or with middle class customers. Why does the last mile make sense? Why, how does it unlock an opportunity for innovation that a company like yours would be focused on? I think, uh, first of all, we need to realize <coughs> that big corporations are part of society <coughs> and with that carry responsibility for what happens in society. Um, it's also a, a fact in these days that if you don't link your own strategies to addressing some of the big challenges society is facing, uh, longer term you uh, run the risk of not being relevant anymore. And we see many examples of companies who lose their relevance because they don't contribute to addressing some of the societal challenges. There are, and you mentioned the numbers yourself, Raj, uh, in your introduction. There are hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people who don't have access to health care. That is something we should take to heart, and that is something that we should become part of the solution of. Uh, <clears throat> in my view, what is required is that we innovate in products, in technology, in operations, um, in financing models, in business models, that we also innovate in the way we collaborate. Uh, and the second thing, and that is probably more important, is leadership. That we do take action and responsibility to change things, because this is so highly complex, and there are so many interdependencies, that there are always 25,893 reasons why it cannot be done. And it takes a couple of people who look each other in the eye and say, we are going to make this happen. And I think that, it, that is what is required. It's, it is leadership from the public sector, from the private sector, from NGOs, uh, joining forces and uniting around this common goal, which indeed also constitutes a moral obligation. And I think that's a critical point because <clears throat> when, when people ask me, and I do get many people who know the slogan about last mile health, or about last mile first, but I don't know that they fully adopt it. They see it as a nice thing to have. But I think your point, Ronald, is important that it becomes an opportunity for leadership because if we can figure this out, if we can go where Last Mile Health goes in, in Liberia and actually solve the problems there in the most challenging locations, then we can do it anywhere. Absolutely. We, can, we can revolutionize the way we provide health care. Barbara, I'd like to bring you in on that point, if I might, because I know you're working in many of the most challenging places in the world. And we often think, as we just... up front, you have to really sit and think from where else you could actually engage. And uh, so in, in the case, for example, of our work in Somalia, we had to take a very, very long time to sit back and think, where is it that another government could be relevant in a, in a country like this? This is not only about uh, injecting new funds, it's also making oneself relevant with, with those funds. And so that's how certain pieces of research have, have come up to try and understand what kind of environment we had to, to evolve in. And, and maybe one of the not so big discoveries, I mean for everyone here in the room is pretty straightforward thinking, but for someone who's coming from, from a completely different perspective, the first point was to realize that even when the, the system, the traditional way or the um, government-centric way of thinking a health system is not necessarily there or is put under extreme stress. Uh, you have other forms of organization that appear almost naturally, like an organic thing that's not necessarily uh, linear. 
So what we have realized is that people have this ability or this resilience to just sort themselves out to a certain extent. And when you have countries where um, the last mile is pretty much half the country, if not more than that, then this sort of movements and, uh, and just adjustments happen to be at scale already. And the question we were really asking ourselves and still don't necessarily have an answer on how it could be relevant is, um, is really to see how they are overlooked. And are you talking about community-based organizations? What kind, give us an example of the kinds of informal groups you're talking about. I think that now from the position of a government, I'm going to be a bit bold in saying that this most of the time are not necessarily community-based. In a way they are community-based, but they're often based on business. So th there is maybe one thing that the private sector or the business sector is very good at doing comparatively to a government agents, which is navigating complexity. And this stressed sort of environments tend to be extremely complex with many actors that are scattered, that are not necessarily organized, that they have their own logic of functioning. And people like us or me who tend to be pretty much linear fail to understand that complexity most of the time and we would like to be able to see the perfect world where things happen in a linear way. And uh, business people tend to be much more uh, able to navigate that in trying to find all possible niches to respond to a demand or to even just work outside of a particular territory, work cross-border, and these kind of things that normally from a government perspective you can't really do. So most of the initiatives we have actually seen were community-based or local indigenous businesses that were trying to offer a service to, to the people. Now I'm not trying to, to simplify because obviously this has also a set of questions in terms of quality, in terms of regulation, in terms of many other issues we have been discussing these days, but it still is a reality and what we have realized is even after a crisis is more or less settled, these dynamics don't tend to go away. So it's either we do with them or we do with them. I think the thread through what we've heard from all three early interventions here is if we really care about the last mile, we need to deal with the realities that are there. We need to deal with the fact that that's where people live. That's where the need is greatest. And that's where perhaps local businesses and formal sector are playing a key role. Um, I want to just continue on that point and I'll ask all of you who are, I see some people nodding along and writing, uh, writing some notes that we will come to you very early for questions and comments to try to hold us accountable on this panel to make sure that we are getting to the core issues on, on last mile first. Uh, so I'll be coming to you very soon. But with that, I want to turn to Professor Francis Omaswa, who is the Executive Director of the African Center for Global Health and Social Transformation, to continue us on this theme of the context. You know, wh how should we be thinking about last mile first? Where do we begin? Indeed. Uh, where do we begin? I would like to advocate for the beginning to be the individual, we, the persons, and our families. 96% of people are born normal, and the body is biologically organized very precisely to make sure that you feel well, and that you are feeling well so that you can do those things which you want to do. But very often, it is we who disorganize this system. We start to do things which the system is not intended to handle, and we become ill. We get diseases, some of them after years, and we need medical care. Yet the idea should be for us to encourage individuals to look after themselves, to obey their bodies, so that they don't need health care for as long as possible, to keep healthy people healthy, if possible, until they die of old age. I'm sure here you're referring to the non-communicable disease crisis, really, that is growing in, in many countries that are still it, facing the challenge of people without access to very basic primary health care. Yes, that's lifestyle, uh, which brings uh, non-communicable diseases. But even infectious diseases, if you give individuals knowledge which makes them stay away from infections, 
then they don't catch those infections and they remain healthy. So it is the entire spectrum of maintaining good health. You know, and the body is very, very, very well organized. Let's just obey it. If you are hungry, it tells you eat. You, are, you feel hungry if your glucose is down. If you are short of water, you feel thirst, take the water. If you feel hot, you sweat so that the, the heat evaporates, and so on and so on and so on. But very often, we don't educate people to take care of themselves and their families. And if people are educated, they will know how to behave. In Uganda, we brought down the prevalence of HIV from an average of 18% down to 6% pre-ARVs just by talking to them. And then they behave in a way which keeps them away from HIV. When we had an Ebola outbreak uh, in the north of Uganda, it was the biggest Ebola before those other ones which came later. But we controlled that using communities, village health teams who owned responsibility. Once they trust the health system, they identify a sick person, they bring them to you, and then you deal with them. So I would like very much to advocate for our health systems to increase health literacy, to encourage people to live well. At one time, I was the Director General in the Ministry of Health in Uganda. For six years, every day, many times, I recorded in my own voice, health is made at home and only repaired in health facilities when it breaks down. <laughs> you know, and it went on, be clean, eat well, do not share accommodation with animals. So it stopped there. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is my first mile, and it should not be the last mile, it should be the first mile. I have a corollary to it, maybe if you give me time later, I, will later, yeah. I would like also to say where is the government in all this. Let's come back to that point, we will, yeah. we will come back to that, but I, I want to bring in some of our other panelists. Karangwa Francois Xavier is the executive director of the UPHLS organization here in Kigali. Uh, Karangwa, I, I want to make sure when we think of the last mile, we're not just thinking about geography. Of course, that's important, but we also need to think about marginalized communities, people who might be living in conflict, might be living in urban slums, might be dealing with stigma. So tell us about how to think about the last mile when we, when we come up with that in our mind. What should we envision? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. So uh, on my side, um, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the un, universal health coverage uh, will be attended when everyone will be included, meaning without barriers uh, for some uh, of us. So uh, focusing uh, on the vulnerable group, but uh, talking about people with disabilities, so uh, to reach the universal health, uh, health coverage, we need uh, first of all, to agree on the principles that uh, we, 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 we can agree. Because for, uh, for, for, for us, removing barriers is one of uh, the, key, um, the key message that we can give. Uh, but to remove barriers, uh, we need, first of all, to have social and cultural acceptability for all. If uh, social and culture are not accept some people, including especially uh, vulnerable group, will not reach uh, this principle. Uh, we need also to have a look on physical accessibility. So how uh, are accessible? If I can take an example of uh, persons with disabilities, you are uh, in some countries where geographical, cover, uh, geographical uh, situation uh, is not uh, accessible like uh, in Rwanda where we have uh, uh, mountains, it is still a challenge to access the health facilities. So uh, we need to remove also uh, uh, that barrier, but also uh, we need to look on the financial affordability. Uh, vulnerable group meaning critical uh, social and economical situation. So if they are not affordable to reach the 
the, 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 the health uh, uh, financing or the health system. So this is a challenge uh, uh, for uh, this group. Uh, to and get- what, So what would you say to governments, policymakers who might say, but that sounds very expensive. It sounds very hard. We already have a hard enough time funding our health system. If we start thinking about every vulnerable and marginalized group, how do we afford it? What's your, what would be your message to, to policymakers with that idea in mind? Uh, if, like, I can give an example, um, during the last uh, London Disability uh, Summit, government were committed to different uh, uh, actions to be done within a deadline. For example, in Rwanda, we have around 500 health facilities, and the, most of them, they are not accessible. And from there, up to now, the government uh, was committed from that summit that by 2030, all health facilities will be upgraded uh, compared to the Rwandan Ibridi Court, meaning to be accessible uh, for persons with disabilities. So for me, what we need is uh, the political will or the political choice, because when, when you have a political will, you can give a time to resolve the different challenges. Thank you for that. And I want to bring in, before we go to questions and interventions from the floor, again, I'm coming, coming to all of you shortly, so get ready. Um, I, want to, I want to bring in another community health worker. We're very honored to have a second community health worker in the session, Margaret Kilonzo. You're from Kenya. You're in, which part of Kenya are you based? In Nairobi? Kibera. In Kibera? Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Margaret Kilonzo as community health work from Kibera, Nairobi, Kenya. I have been a community health worker for 20 years now, and I was chosen by the community because I understand the community very well, and I was our role model. After I was chosen, I had a passion for those community members. I was trained by HAMREF in collaboration with Minister of Health, to perform duties in these community members. So, after we were co trained on community strategy, we were given households. Like myself, I was given 100 structures with over 500 household members, which I took care of them. We started by taking their data by registration. Then, after that, we started collecting their data. Every time we go to those houses, we do identification of problems or any cases. We do referrals. We do follow-ups, default tracing, and all kind of health issues. We do mobilization of campaigns. And anything which is concerned about health, we are there for them. Remember, we act as the link between the community members and the health formal sector. Now, before Hamref came, there was a lot of problems in the community because we didn't have any information concerning health. There was a lot of high rate of mortality deaths. Mothers were giving birth on the households. The children were not finishing their immunization. There was poor sanitation, and people were suffering a lot of infections, means of misconception, discrimination and stigma. But I thank God, Hamref came in. It trained us. We attended so many trainings and refresher courses. To an extent, they have even trained us on how to collect data, report, and also attend trainings through mobile phones, which is a plus to us. Remember, when we are doing this, we have done so much that we have brought impact to this community, and we have a lot of achievements. As for now, it is very rare to find a woman delivering in the house. All the children are getting the full immunization. It's only maybe very rare cases to find a child who is not fully immunized. The environment has improved. And now, people are embracing on going to look for services in the clinic. But remember SCHWs, we don't focus more on cura curative services. We really focus on preventive measures for these people because we tell them how to wash hands, the importance of hand washing, 
importance of doing what is recommended so that you don't become ill. Because, as my friend said, it starts from our house. And that is what we are advocating for. And for us, we are very happy because we have addressed issues of stigma and discrimination, which you find now we have started support groups where people can express their problems. And in fact, people now have changed their perspectives on some long-term illnesses. Because before that, you could find a lot of defaulters, but as for now, they have reduced. In fact, the CHWs are doing a lot in those communities. But remember, we have also some challenges. Remember, these CHWs are also parents. They need to provide for their families. Like me, I am a single mother of two, and I have to balance between community work and my family. And so, remember we are not paid anything. We are just volunteers. So I have to take my time, do work for the community because I can't leave them. They are a part of us, we can't leave them. And we have passion of helping these community members. And also, I have passion for my family. So in the morning, sometimes we have to practice something called DOTS, which means daily observed treatment. In the morning, I have to go to those clients' house, give them medication, in the evening, the same. And it is my responsibility, I have to do that. But by the end, I'm not getting anything. Remember, we need medical covers. We are advocating for medical covers in the community, yet ourselves, we don't have. Thank you for that message. You, you have been, Margaret has, Margaret has been a uh, community health worker for 20 years, and I'm sure you've seen that this has changed, right? Ha, w w were you invited to an event like this before? Have you spoken on a stage like this before? Community health workers are in a new, in a new place now, I think, in, in the way the global health community thinks of it, and I'm, it's taken too long. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I want to go to everyone in the audience first, if I can. So are there any hands, uh, people who have a question or a comment? What are we missing in the conversation so far? I know there are many people who are working at the last mile. What are we missing? I see a couple of hands back here. I don't know if we have microphones, otherwise I'll just come to you. And if you could just tell us your name and uh, where you're from, what organization you're with, and, and I'll grab the microphone back if you're not doing a short question, because we don't have that much time. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Joseph Wangombe. I come from Nairobi University School of Public Health. I want to throw in a new slogan in the discussion, but before I get there, I want to say what I'm doing. I am a health economist of the very first generation of African health economists in the early 80s. That's when I was trained. I have gone on abandoning health economics now. I am working on uh, neglected tropical diseases, particularly Reishmaniasis, which we call Kalaza in, uh, in uh, this area. And I'm working in one of those populations which are far to reach, like we are talking about the last mile, because it is very difficult to go to them. Uh, to them, of course, the disease is not neglected. It is an epidemic. Among them, it is killing their children, it is killing their people, and so on. And for the last six years, we have been doing that, trying to get them treated, getting them uh, into the hospitals, and so on. Then I discovered with this, that experience that what we are doing and that is why we run away to try and treat this disease. We are not realizing and accepting which is what should be the slogan and the planning base. We are here dealing with a population line which extends from the, the Karamajong in uh, Uganda, the whole northern Kenya, the whole of Ogaden in uh, Somalia, continuing to northern Cameroon, northern uh, all the way to the Asahel area of what we should call neglected tropical populations. And that is the slogan I'm introducing. We have no design of how to get these people the neglected tropical populations. Thank you much for that, Joseph. Uh, that is a really important slogan. We're going to come back for responses from the panel in a moment to that. We have a couple more hands. Oh, we have a microphone coming to you. Please stand, tell us your name, your organization, where you're from. I'm Phyllis Awar, I'm a medical doctor. I teach and I'm a researcher at Makere University. 
I've worked with community health workers for the last 10 years. But the issue, uh, while we are defining last mile, the issue that we need to also keep in mind is the connotation of poor quality um, care, lack of uh, standards, and really the lowest um, or the least resourced uh, options for the last mile. And that, that we should uh, uh, ensure that we work to change that perception or actually the, the delivery that we provide at the last mile that is now seen as poor quality and uh, um, in, in line with that. Thank you. Thank you for that, Phyllis. We're gonna, if we can bring the microphone over this way, we're going to take a couple of more very quick comments or questions. We'll take these two quickly, keep them quick, please, and then we'll come to others uh, in our next session. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for today's discussion. I'm called Dr. Jennifer Tuevaze Musoke from Uganda. Um, I, I just want to let the audience know that behind every pregnancy, there is a man. And... <laughs> And behind any under five child, any moving child, there is a man. And I just want to tell the audience that when you talk about universal health coverage, whether you bring issues of insurance, whether you bring anything to do with money, the man is involved. He's the decision maker of the household. He's the one to say yes whether the mother should go for antenatal or not, because he's the one who provides transport. I can request that we see male involvement in this. In Uganda, recently the president launched male involvement in healthcare. I really want it to come out. We just have to accept that in African society. Also, I think in, pro, in European and other societies, a man is very important. Whether a woman is educated or not, you have to go back to the man. Sir, can we take the child to hospital? He says no, he goes to drink. We need to have male involvement. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Thank you for that message. And we will, I'm eager to hear the panel's response to that and others. We're gonna take one very quick one. Very quick, please. Um, hello everyone, I'm Ruth Kaziga from Uganda, PhD student uh, with an interest in uh, self-esteem and body image. So a colleague and I um, implemented a project on uh, let's talk about sex, uh, so encouraging parents to talk to their children about sex. However, we've um, sort of had backlash from the government, <laughs> so I was, I was wondering uh, uh, what points would you give uh, people like us, especially the youth, on how we can tackle or talk to the government to encourage this. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you for all of those. Thank you for all of those. Uh, it's a big room. Sorry, it took me a minute to come back. Uh, all of those interventions. And I know there are more hands here. We will come to you in a moment. I want to get the panel back involved in that. Let's start, if we can, with Joseph, our health economist, and his point. You know, we're talking about neglected, trop uh, we're talking about last mile as kind of one big generic group. We talked a little bit about fragile communities. He's suggesting neglected tropical populations maybe is an important way to think about the challenge when we consider who we're really targeting. Curious if there are any thoughts about that as a, as a way to frame this. Magnus, any reaction? I think it's a valid point that has been made about um, neglected tropical communities. Because even in urban areas, you do have slums, um, like one of the areas that Margaret works, where uh, access to healthcare is you know, almost non-existent. And, and therefore, whilst the focus has been uh, in terms of providing better healthcare and access to healthcare to remote community and communities that, uh, that are hard to reach, Communities within um, other parts of the countries, which are in you know, semi-urban or urban uh, areas as well, that are underserved and, uh, well, I don't want to call them poor populations because somebody just made an observation about that, but these communities are equally in their dire need of uh, access to health 
facilities. And therefore, we, we need to also address those populations. Uh, it's a valid point. It's one that both governments and NGOs and, and uh, donor organizations should, should, make concerted, to, should take a concerted effort to support those communities and provide health care for them. Thank you for adding that point to the discussion, Joseph. Maybe we move on to, to another one, Barbara. Uh, Phyllis brought up this point that when we think about the informal sector, we think about the last mile, we could fall into the trap of providing access, but without having real quality and having standards. Um, this is a trap that I think many in the education sector feel like they fell into when they said, well, the goal is to get kids in school. Now, we got kids in school, but the learning outcomes aren't actually there. We could end up providing health care at some level, but the quality isn't really there. How do you look at this in the communities where you're working? Well, I think there are two ways of looking at it. One is not disagreeing with that fact, but at least saying that rather than building a parallel one that looks more quality and that might not be as cost effective, maybe starting from what's already existing and improving it from where it is, is, is one way of, of picking on that topic. The other one is what do you compare quality with? If you, if you ask sometimes the, the patients that have to go in a, in a public facility, and I'm really putting myself on the spotlight here because I represent the public facilities. I'm not trying to, to point finger at anyone. But when you have long queues and not necessarily uh, responsive facilities that might be actually free of charge and people choose to pay for something else because they feel that that was not quality enough, when we talk about informal sort of mechanisms that are not quality is compared to which other quality people are running away from. So I think this, these are a bit the two types of considerations without necessarily having an answer on whether it's good or bad, but that I would pick the conversation from. And it's important to remember the context, and it's not just in fragile communities, but many parts of many countries in Africa where you have high percentages of the health spending are out of pocket of people making that exact decision that you talked about. Francis, your, your thoughts on this? Uh, quality. Quality is unnegotiable. We can't talk about poor quality for some communities. And it takes us to the point which uh, our colleague from Philips uh, made about leadership and governance of health. So these difficult to reach communities need to have systems designed which make sure that they get quality services. Standards are set. There are mechanisms for delivery, for monitoring, for learning from mistakes. And there should be absolutely no question of us imagining that there should be standards of quality for this community and the other. And that's where the talk about community health workers comes about. Because you need people to reach every house. And people who are prepared for that work, who are supported while they are doing that work, and who are known and are part of the health system. The, to me, the, one of the biggest challenges of health in Africa is poor governance. We have very brilliant plans. They don't get implemented to scale. So I wish we could spend more time on having uh, accountability mechanisms at all levels uh, so that what we plan to do actually happens. But there is no worry to me that uh, poor people uh, are inevitably uh, prone uh, to poor quality care. Thank you. I see you, Ronald, nodding your head. What's your thought on yeah, this? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm very happy uh, with Professor Francis's interventions, both the first one and the second one. Uh, and I think if there are a couple of takeaways uh, from this session, one is that what we talk about as health care is basically a misnomer. It's sick care. It's taking care of people who are sick. That's what we do. Uh, enabling people, empowering people to take care of their own health, working on prevention, early detection, uh, which you very often do in the last mile, is critical. And, and I, I thank you for sharing that insight. I think it's a key insight. I think the second thing is <clears throat> the question that came up about cost. Um, maybe we should talk about investment and look at it integrally. Because we know that investments you make in the last mile lead to savings 
in secondary care and tertiary care, and it leads to more productive societies. If you look at it integrally, uh, the justification of investing in the last mile is there. Now, the point being that we will always be able to come up with all the questions and roadblocks and barriers to not engage in this discussion, because we are bound to our own conventional paradigms. And that's where the leadership notion should come in. At a certain point in time, people need to stand up and say, we are going to march in this direction and join forces, because else it will not happen. And we will continue to invest in sick care rather than in health care. I'm glad you brought up that point, and I think it resonates with many in the room who are thinking that, you know, there are many obstacles that we could come up with. We could have a very long list for why we'll never achieve this. But on the other hand, there's been tremendous progress in many of the countries in Africa, many countries represented here. There's good reason to think we can do it. We did get a couple of comments that I think are, are right that we get in our own way sometimes. There was an important comment that men are a key part of the equation. And are we thinking about them when we're thinking about health financing, for example, or how to make an inclusive health system? And there was another critical point about sex conversations being critical, and yet there's pushback sometimes from governments. And how do you have that open conversation without stigma? So I wonder, Francois or Margaret, if you have a, have a thought on, on those two comments that were made earlier. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, on my side, uh, what we need, uh, uh, we need uh, to make a joint effort together between the all partners, uh, but also uh, with including uh, the, the, the beneficiaries of the services. Uh, why? Because uh, most of the time we can have a, a, plan, a plan from the national level, uh, the, but remember the, the programs are implemented to the community level. So it's uh, good to have uh, a joint, uh, let me say, plan planning, implementation, as well as the monitoring and evaluation, how to evaluate if uh, uh, people, they have uh, access to the health. But it's good also uh, to, 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 to use people, nothing for us without us. If there are uh, some vulnerable group who are facing uh, uh, lack of services, it's better that we can include them uh, to be in the services. So in that case, uh, will be included and they are going to have a, a, a good services. But uh, uh, mainly we need to start by the policy level up to the, on, to the community to avoid especially the stigma and discrimination which are facing down to the community. It's very aligned I think with Francis' point and Ronald's point about starting with the individual, not just designing a beautiful system on the top of a, of a health system, but actually talking to people on the ground, understanding their needs. Uh, to that point, Dr. Jennifer suggested that getting men in the conversation is critical. So, Margaret, I wonder, in your experience in Quebec, how do you, do you face that challenge of getting men involved as you go household to household and, and try to provide uh, information and preventative care? How, how do you see this challenge? Okay, thank you so much. For one, I can support what that madam said. Most of the men are not involved so much because you find always the mother is there with the kids, the father has gone, even sometimes meeting them in the house is not easy. So it's a very small percentage of men who are involved in taking care of their children, are involved in what we do. But we think maybe they'll change one day, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're talking to the right room. I'm sure there are many behavioral scientists here who are working on exactly that problem. Uh, <laughs> we want, we, right there, right. We, <laughs> I think Gitinji is being pulled into the conversation. Yeah, what, what, what is your thought on this, Dr. Gitinji? I'm just going to tell Margaret, thank you for being patient with us. <laughs> So let me come back to this side of the room. We have limited time, but there were a lot of hands. So um, if we can bring the microphone again. Uh, and we'll start right here, and I'll just start with my microphone before we get to, to a few others. And I'll get, keep it brief if you don't mind. Say your name. Thank you very much. I'm Professor Stella Nyangwe. I used to be a WHO representative. I'm retired. I'm on the AMREF Health Program Committee. We seem to think that when we say reaching the last mile, we are only thinking about the poor, underserved communities. I want to bring to the fore the issue of the rich and the wealthy not wanting health care. I live in South Africa where we are having upsurge of measles outbreaks 
because some parents, very educated, very knowledgeable, don't want vaccination. Now they're putting the poor children at risk because of their beliefs. There are some um, religious groups that don't want transfusions. So when we think about reaching the last mile, let's think about those people who put the public health, the public in danger because of their beliefs. Thank you for putting that on the agenda. I appreciate that. Okay, many, many, many hands. I'm gonna walk, let's see, we have a mic in the back, so let's start all the way in the back if you can. All the way in the back. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Rika from the African Palliative Care Association. As we talk about the last mile and the packaging of what will be delivered and who will deliver it, we have to think about a component that has not been talked about much, and that is palliative care and hospice care. Those should be part of the considerations that we must have. Thank you very much. Thank you as well for adding that to the agenda. You're all taking my message to heart. Tell us what we're missing. That's very helpful. I'm going to go here very quickly. Thank you, Dr. Tababu from Ethiopia. So uh, I am glad that we uh, are having you know, uh, a lot of talk about uh, community health workers, universal health coverage, uh, but uh, it's always uh, a continuum of care or a spectrum of care from the last mile to the tertiary care or to the specialized care. So uh, how do we, I want to hear from the panel, how do we promote like partnership and the collaboration between the different levels of the healthcare system and the professionals? Because at times, you know, when we over focus on the lower level, uh, we are a kind of uh, creating some level of uh, rivalry between the higher level and the, the, low, the lower level. So how can we promote task sharing and the collaboration within the system. Thank you. Thank you for that as well. Again, several more hands, but I'm gonna quickly go back to the panel first just to make sure you have time to respond to a couple of these. Ronald, I wonder if you wanna to respond to what yeah. Dr. Babu just talked about, that we need an integrated health system. And again, I'll even ask the panel to keep it fairly brief if we can to get, get back to more questions. I, I'm very happy with the opportunity because I do feel that um, um, going forward, uh, only leaning upon tertiary and secondary care uh, will prove to be inefficient uh, and, and, and impossible. There will not be enough doctors, nurses and hospitals and hospital beds to take care of all the people that require care. So I see complementarity between the, the, <clears throat> the last mile primary care, secondary and tertiary. And we have a good example with what we do for instance with community life centers which are uh, more or less pop-up clinics but they are connected with secondary and tertiary care institutions. Uh, so there is a model there where there is collaboration between the various tiers of providing support uh, and with the aim of eventually covering more people and giving more access. So uh, let's not position it as a, as a conflict that is built in or designed in, but as something that can be complementary or should be complementary for it to be successful and effective. Thank you for that. I'm going to go back to to the audience, again, quick interventions if you might. No, I'm sorry, I have a question. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is in reference to corporate social responsibility. We still have, um, this is a new concept for Liberia. We have people who pay their taxes, but that's about it. And at the last mile, for example, we have phone companies around the country, but there are certain places where our nurses, our healthcare workers have no access to the internet because there's not a cell tower. What is your experience, Mr. Ronald, in bringing you know, our private sector around the table to be able to further the agenda of the government? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm very encouraged with what I see because <clears throat> the, the notion of corporate social responsibility uh, being seen as something that is obligation-driven is uh, slowly but surely being replaced by a, a, a concept where there is social investment uh, as, as a... As a uh, based upon the deep understanding that that defines your relevance as part of society. And if you, if you generate value only in monetary terms and you do that at the expense of somebody else or parts of society, you longer term will not survive. Uh, and that, that notion you see in more and more companies uh, being a kind of rallying cry behind really investing in development of underserved communities not with a for-profit uh, goal, 
but because companies increasingly also measure their social impact. I mean, to give you one example, many of you in this, in this room I know, know the company I work for, Philips, from the radios and the television sets and what have you. But the highest goal that we have publicly committed to as a company is that we want to improve the lives of 3 billion people a year by the year 2025. That's the highest goal. That's the impact that we want to be held accountable for. And we do that, amongst others, by being commercially successful. But a big chunk of that commitment is also what I'm trying to cover with the Phillips Foundation, which is a registered charity. And we try to reach 300 million people a year by the year 2025 that currently don't have any access to healthcare. And we do that not only by leveraging money and, and human resources, but also our intellectual capital, innovation. So companies are coming to the party, and rightfully so, because that is the best guarantee for their long-term survival. We should note that Ronald actually chairs the Phillips Foundation, and the question came from Liberia's Minister of Health. So thank you very much for that exchange. Um, and let me, let me just go to others here. Let's see, I'm gonna start in the back, just to be fair. Let me give you a, a chance, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Dokas Mwandembo from Kenya. I work in the Ministry of Labor. And uh, I really appreciate this conference because they gave us a place to put a poster for the older persons. So I'm really excited. My concern, uh, reaching the last mile, I'm just concerned about last mile in our lives. As we know, we are living longer, as long as we are improving the, 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 the health conditions. So I would really like us to, like the AMREF keep training caregivers, they should also take the initiative, care, take, teaching them, taking care of the older persons on how to help them reach the facilities. And you know, the older persons are voiceless, they don't shout, you can hear the youth shout. But then they are just they are quiet waiting. So maybe it uh, brings us an agenda of geriatrics that we should be able to put it on board so that we can uh, we can reach to the last mile to take care of the aging population. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to the agenda. Let's see. We have a microphone there. If we can bring it to this gentleman. You're on. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Abib Salami. I come from Nigeria. I work for Pathfinder International. Um, I think it's important that we all have a clear understanding of last mile. Uh, that will help us in engaging with government, with donors, and even the people at the community level that we're trying to get across to with services. Uh, <clears throat> When last mile started, it was referring to that last point of healthcare services that uh, people can get access to. Uh, I think we are beginning to move away from that and bringing in geography, bringing in key populations, and bringing all kinds of things. This is going to be bringing different connotations, different meanings to what last mile means. Uh, if we stick to what last mile is, then it means that all those different geographies and key populations can still get access to healthcare that we want them to. And we also know that there is a huge gap between that last mile and people in the community having access. And that's the bridge that the community health workers are bridging. So if we have that same understanding, it will be easy for us to engage the different stakeholders and achieve what we're trying to achieve at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And uh, let's see, if the hands want to come up, we'll take one last comment right here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. All protocol uh, observed. My name is Nalili Chirwa, and I'm from South Africa. Um, thank you to the panelists for their contributions, first and foremost. I think my concern um, as a young activist is the nature of the contributions, which almost come off as fictional. It feels like we are talking about a different Africa that I'm currently not living in. Um, maybe there's another Africa that we are not, we are not knowing about. It would be great if you tell us about this Africa so we can go then get access to universal health care that looks as good as it's being pitched here. Um, it seems that uh, the concern is upholding a good reputation for different entities. Uh, you know, I feel like in spaces like this, if we want a truthful representation of how healthcare looks like, you must go to the communities and get the young women who are queer, who are lesbian, who have disabilities to come and tell us how universal healthcare is in their countries because otherwise 
we are serving a purpose that only seems to benefit uh, state officials which are trying to preserve themselves more than they are trying to preserve the people that they're supposed to serve. And uh, I might be digressing, I might be coming in and out of things because I'm obviously frustrated. Um, <laughs> well, that's a, that was a critical also, point. I don't want to lose that before Yes. You this is for the entire panel, right? Um, divorcing universal health care from economics is also like a very grave mistake. Uh, we end up saying things like uh, people need to eat healthy when we know that a choice or the decision or the ability to eat healthy is an economic uh, situation or positionality of people. And we end up saying things like people must drink water when people don't have access to clean water, when there are no taps in most parts and many rural areas and uh, quality is also very subjective né? the centers that we are referring to that are being referred to are centers that they don't even use right uh, so you'll find that state officials prefer to use or rather know that they can only use private institutions because the public ones are not good at all and also access is something that is like for a heterosexual man access to a healthcare center is completely different to what it might mean to a woman who's overweight who has children who is dark skinned uh, who is living with hiv who's living with a disability who's an immigrant and we are missing those voices to tell us what does universal health care looks like for them in particular um please and thank you very much thank you If you, if, you think we, if you think we planted her in the audience and I, I knew to call on her last, it, is not, it was not arranged. Thank you so much for bringing those messages. And maybe we can close on We, we should on transact those. upon this, though. Yeah, let, let's, let's... We let's, should transact upon this, though, because I sense an enormous amount of anger and frustration. And, and I see a lot of uh, support for that anger or frustration. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't feel good about this conference if we would not be able to convert that energy into something more constructive. Uh, because one thing is to conclude that there are a lot of things that need to be fixed and that are not right. And I agree with, uh, with the speaker. Uh, but we need to, to really unite and join forces to get it right. Just concluding that it is not okay is not good enough. You're absolutely right. I want to go to Francis because I know this is a point you want to make about government accountability, about holding our own governments accountable. It's good to have passion. And the last speaker, uh, anger and so on, it's that passion, it's that anger that is going to get, out of this, get us out of this conference charged to go and do something. But what is that something? So that something links also to a question from uh, uh, a gentleman from Ethiopia here about continuum of care. It also links to the question about the young lady who wants to talk about sex but can't talk about sex. And it also links with the neglected populations. So the beginning is that all of us should own responsibility for getting this right, not blame others. And the young lady there, I would like to uh, uh, encourage her to be part of the solution through constructive suggestions, through a duty to participate where she lives in improving the system where she, where she is. There is a role for government, of course. If you say, eat well and I have no food, uh, have clean water and there's no clean water, that's where we, the government comes in. The government comes in to provide those, uh, that support to individuals, their families, their communities, which they cannot do themselves and which are better done collectively. But for that to happen, the government should have a health system which is mainly in two parts. One is primary health care system, which should be a, a top priority, where every household is reached. There should be household registers, and those community health workers, 
the also not just health, but also the governance arrangements there so that the rural road network, the water sources, the schools, and et cetera, law and order are taken care of. That's where the government comes in. And then uh, the services, health services, which are provided there, even other services, there should be what they call a minimum package. And those should be provided through the tax base accessible to everyone and we must fight and shout for that then beyond that the next phase of the health system uh, the referral system we should then uh, work to get innovative additional ways of funding through health insurance schemes through various uh, 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 employer schemes etc etc so that there is a link between the primary health care system and the tertiary health care system and the education system. So, but it takes each one of us, we shouldn't live here blaming others. It, we should live here, as Alma Atta told us, we each have a duty and a responsibility to participate in creating our health system. And then, I'm sorry, the last point, <laughs> there is a big cultural issue in getting to the solutions of the neglected populations, of the young people who won't talk about sex and can't do so. Uh, they are religious and cultural uh, barriers. But we also need to design ways of gaining the trust of the Karimojong and the Turkanas. And also, the, the Africa is in transition. There was sex talked about in the, in, in the communities in Africa. But now those communities have been disrupted. That young girl can't talk to her auntie who would be teaching her sex because she's in an urban place. So youth groups should be created. Some mechanism should be found in each community to deal with this. We have to be innovative as uh, uh, Africans in a society that's in transition. Sorry, I'm you. taking so long. Sorry, but, uh, we, we, need to, we do need to move. Unfortunately, the, yes. you, you've put many good points on the table and others have too, which we will not have time to get to. But there is a conversation on Twitter, Africa Health 2019. Use that hashtag if you have a response to anything you've heard and we didn't get to it, please join that conversation online. Magnus, I want to come to you very quickly as well. Thank you. And um, I just want to acknowledge the, there's a salient point that the young lady just made. Uh, I, I, I admire her passion, her advocacy as an activist for better community services, but also the salient point that she made is about how are these panels constituted at conferences? I think we've moved a long way from the days when you just have executive directors, presidents, and professors sitting at these panels to inviting community health workers to have a dialogue with the minister. I think that's a, that's a great um, um, progress. It's a huge amount of progress we've made, something we should have done years ago. But she's suggesting that we actually bring people who are at the last mile, who are actually experiencing what it means to be at the last mile. And that's a very powerful point to make. If we were able to bring, you know, we talk about Liberia where um, the, the uh, minister is here. She knows some of the rural communities where Last My Health works. Maybe next time at a conference like this, we shouldn't just think about bringing community health workers like we did in Astana. We took a community health worker from Liberia all the way to Astana for, for the primary health care conference. Next time, we should look at bringing somebody from the community who is in receipt or not in receipt of health care at the last month. Thank you for that. Now, we've, we're absolutely out of time, but I want to see if there's anything burning that, that Francois, that Karangwa, or that Barbara, you wanted to add to the discussion. No? Okay, we're going we're gonna to move on then if you don't have anything burning. And I, I wanted to see if Margaret might, uh, I believe you had a, a call to action for all of us. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a microphone we can bring up to the front? I think you're looking to stand, and, and I could use one more mic. I'll give you mine for now. Yeah. Come up and tell us. Okay. Now I have a request for all policy makers and the stakeholders who are in this house. Community members understand the community health workers very well, and nobody 
understands the community very well more than the community health worker. Please, stakeholders, you should know these people, they have families to take care of, they should provide for basic needs for their children, at the same time, they should help the community. So please, pay these CHWs so that you can wa see wonders. I know they'll do a lot of things, and they'll do what they can so that we can achieve the UHC. Thank you so much. But remember, CHVs, CHWs are people like you, and they have needs like all of us. Thank you. Thank you for that message. Uh, thank you. Am I on? I think I am. Thank you so much for that, Margaret. Please join me in thanking the panel for the conversation today. Please, please join me in thanking yourselves for contributing so much to the discussion. And, and I just want to mention that um, when I was in, in college, I took a journalism class. DevX is a media company. I work in journalism. And the first journalism class I took, our professor showed us a news report from the Vietnam War era. And it, show, it showed an older reporter wearing kind of a safari outfit. And behind him was a stream of Cambodian refugees. And he had a microphone and he intoned into it in this very deep voice. One can only imagine what is going through the minds of these refugees. Of course, he could have just turned around and asked them. <laughs> and, and to the point that we heard before, I think the health community has changed a lot in that we have started to make this a much more inclusive community. We've started to make this dialogue really reach out to those who need to be part of it, frankly, need to be leading it. And the tools today, the opportunity to directly reach out and find people all over the world, even in some of the most hard to reach places, in places like Liberia, we have that opportunity now in a way we haven't had before. So I want to applaud, finally, this conference for bringing together all of you. I go to a lot of these kinds of events, and this one's really unique. It's critical that Africa, which has its own health agenda, has a conference around that agenda. So thank you for being a part of it today. Thank you. <laughs> Group photo, OK. Stand up. We'll...